Andy Frost at the time was working on Darren's team and uh, said, oh, like we'd, we'd looked at the Oracle and like we, we, we were going to bob in. Like, so we basically met them one night, Andy and Brad and, and Tom was a guy working on the show as well with a couple of the magicians from the Oracle. We just met up and like hung out for a bit. And then Andy dropped the bombshell on Ben and was like, Darren wants to come in to the Oracle. And we were like, okay, that's cool. Like after he's like playing it cool. So essentially, without going all to you know all through the logistics of it, one night after they performed the show, Andy, Brad, Tom, Darren, Andy's partner came into the Oracle, and Ben, who owns the Oracle, asked uh, me, Lewis Laval, and Terry to to perform. So, so we had to do private performances. Uh, at the table for for Darren's table, it was honestly one of the most weird but fulfilling and fun experiences I've ever had in Magic. Hello and welcome to another episode of Desert Island Tricks. Another guest joins me today from his virtual island discussing his favourite tricks of all time. Now this particular performer I've actually known, again, quite a long time now. Uh, I, can't, I wouldn't actually be able to say how long. And he has some very, very cool material. As of late, he sort of resurfaced. He went under under the radar for a few years. He's resurfaced, and at Blackpool 2024, which was earlier on this year, we're recording this in May um, at the moment. This will likely go out later on the year, but back in February, um, his trick was probably my favourite trick of the convention. Um, it was excellent. He came up to me and showed it to me at the Alakazam stand, and I immediately asked him to show Harry and Pete because I thought it was phenomenal. He's really, really clever thinking, and what's great with this particular performer is he is as good with his finger-flicking moves as he is with his more systematic thinking when it comes to magic. He's got a great mix of both of those different things. Today's guest is Mr. Adam Dadswell. Hello, Adam. Hello, Jamie. And uh, thank you for that intro. That was lovely. I'm not sure how much of it is true, but there we go. Uh, all of it is true, of course. <laughs> all of it is true. Um, of course, I knew you all the way back from when you were playing with things like Shootout, which is, um, I'm not sure what you call it now. You might have a different name for it now. No, I still I still refer to, I still refer to it as Shootout. So, yeah. Which is a great move where the deck is laying on the table and after a selection has been taken and lost in the deck, you cut the cards and one card shoots from the middle, actually from the middle, of the deck outwards. It looks like something that should have something built into the deck, but it just uses a normal deck of cards. It's just a cool animation trick. Yeah, it's, it's fun. And it's, um, I mean, I think it was back in, I want to say 2010, something like that now, um, where it was, it was kind of first put out there on, on PDF. That was uh, with with your help, of course. But um, yeah, I think that was one of the biggest comments, which was it, it looks like it should have a gimmick involved, mm -hmm. and of course it, it it didn't, which you know well down went down fairly well with people. So yeah, all good. But now you seem to be now you've resurfaced, so to speak. <clears throat> you seem to be focusing a lot more on mentalism style effects at the moment. Yeah, I think that's fair. I I kind of I went off the radar a little bit. I I performed a lot in my. Uh, kind of late teens, early twenties, I would probably say. Um, and then just, just one, one or two things kind of happened. I, I kind of went into another career, things like that. Um, so I kind of stopped performing, uh, at gigs and things like that. I stopped doing gigs as much. Um, I never really stopped. I never really put the cards down as it were. I, I always continued to kind of read and study and, you know, I would perform socially if you will. Um, but yeah, I think I always had an interest in uh, mentalism. Uh, I think it would be fair to say I was introduced to the idea of that through seeing Darren's work and Darren's shows. I think that's probably how a lot of people kind of got into it, into the kind of whole mentalism side of things. Uh, but I think it was probably over 
I'd probably say the last five five years or so really has been kind of where I've found a lot more joy in that side of magic, if you will, and thinking about things in that way and studying a lot more in those areas. Um, and I've had I've had ideas over time, but it's probably only now where I've started to do something about it, really, and start to kind of pull some of this stuff together and, and start to put it out there for the magic community. Uh, so, yeah, I, th- I think kind of, you know, my back background really was was card magic as you all know um card magic through and through and i still enjoy card magic today um i just feel as though um mentalism is where my focus is right now well i'm very excited to hear your list again normally i I have a little guest but uh a a little guest rather but i don't know where yours is going to go i think it's going to be quite a diverse mix of different things actually i think it'll be probably a mix of a bit of mentalism cards maybe a coin trick or a curveball in there that we're not expecting. We will see then. We will see. We will see. (laughs) And with that being said, if this is your first time listening to Desert Island Tricks, the idea is that Adam is going to be whisked away to his own tropical island somewhere. When he's on the island, he's only allowed to take eight tricks, one book and one non-magic item that he uses for magic. When he's there, the size of the island, what's on the island, if he's got an audience, no audience, all that sort of stuff, we don't really mind. It's basically the ultimate tricks that he would have to perform forever and ever if that's all he could perform. And with that being said, we are going to jump on our jet uh, fly over to Adam's desert island and find out what's in his first position. Okay, so um, yeah, I guess I guess it's probably worth mentioning a lot of what I've put together in this list here has featured or does still feature in my working set, if you will. So if I'm performing, whether it be a mix and mingle close up or whether I'm doing a parlor show, you'll I mean you'll see which ones fit into which category. Um, as we go through, but that's kind of how I've looked at this, which is what have I either performed, which has, has added a lot of value um, in terms of for, for myself or uh, what is still in my working repertoire. So I'll kick off, uh, and they're in no particular order, um, with Dr. Daly's Last Trick by uh, Mr. Jacob uh, Daly. And I know there are a million and one variations of this trick, um, and there are a lot of gimmicked versions of this trick as well, where it's more visual and things like that. But for the longest time, I'd say for the last 10 to 15 years now, it's been something that I will go back to and perform. Um, I frame it as a bit of an observation test. I say, out of the group, who's got the best observation skills? Uh, and then I go into uh, uh, the trick. Now, for, for anyone who's who's not seen it, um, it's a transposition effect, essentially, um, with, let's say, the two red aces and the two black aces. Obviously, other cards will work. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's um, it's a very simple transposition effect. And I would even say the version I performed today is probably a variation because there's that many. Um, and, it, and I just introduced four playing cards, and I just say we're just going to try an observation test. Um, and, you know, for all the really clever routines or methods that I think I employ in other areas of my work, this always gets great reactions. Um, just two cards transposing for the other two cards. Um, I've always had fun with it. Um, I've played around with different presentational angles. Um, and of course, playing it as an observation test, uh, I then turn around and say, of course, misdirection only works, so it works best when you're focusing something on something that doesn't really matter. For example, this thing was never going to happen. That was just the moment that allowed me to sneak in there and switch the cards around or whatever it might be. Um, So that is the first item on my list, Dr. Daly's last trick, or the last trick of Dr. Daly. I've heard it referred to in both ways. Great choice. I'm curious to know, do you still use the original method or have you changed for a different method? So so the original version I saw... And again, I'd have to go back into like the books and have a look, but was using the deck. So it was it was on top of the deck, and uh, th- that's where the uh, moves happen, let's just say, um, before they were placed into people's hands. Um, but for now, I just use four cards. I just bring four cards out, and the handling I use um, is just a series of, can I say, I'm going to say it, d- d- like lifts, right? <laughs> um, I don't know how much I'm supposed to say on here, Jamie. Um, it just uses a series of lifts, um, but it's all it's all done fairly 
like openly and transparently. So uh, I think it probably is is a variant of, but but I've not really changed the like. I I probably switched to doing it that way probably ten years ago, and then I've done it ever since in that way. Great, really, really good choice. Um, and in with a card trick first. So yeah, mm. you kind of when you said, oh, it's probably card tricks and mentalists. I was thinking, oh god. <laughs> <laughs> if it's your list, it's your list. Um, it's okay. it's always perfect that way. Uh, but what's in your second position? Uh, in my second position is another card trick, Jamie. Um, I should probably mix this list up a bit in terms of the order I I, I reveal them to you. But uh, my second uh, uh, spot is card under box. Uh, and I know you're going to push me because I have listened to a couple of these and they are very good. Uh, I know you're going to push me on which version do you want, Adam? Um, and it would have to be Box Clever by James Brown. Um, this, I know people sometimes refer to an effect as their thousand timer. This is probably my thousand timer. Um, more so when I was performing a lot of table hopping and more close-up magic than anything else, more card magic than the mentalism. Um, you know, if someone said to me, oh, can you show us something? I'd just go into card on the box every time. Um, and my uh, kind of uh, handling of it is pretty much what James did. Like on the, was it professional? Uh, I'm going to say the name. Is it DVD set wrong? The professional, professional opportunist. opportunist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that the one? I think it was yeah, RSVP. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, great, like great set. And and I would I would actually argue that the kind of James's DVD set. Lee Smith had some DVDs out at the time as well. Um, Gary Jones, obviously. I mean, those those kind of uh, types of DVD sets were quite influential in kind of me and card magic and kind of getting me involved. But um, yeah, card in the box. Um, it's just a brilliant effect. And when when the entire, I mean, for those who haven't seen. James's routine, you know, there's a series of moments, a uh, series of phases, but ultimately a signed card is jumping under the card box that's on the table or in somebody's hand. Um, and then the entire deck goes under the box and things. So there's these kind of really big moments. Um, and, it, and it's just, and then the, the entire deck goes inside the box if you want to do a final phase and things. Um, I must shout out though, Daniel Chard. I've been trying to. I've been meaning to learn Daniel's card underbox because uh, he he claims it's worth looking at. So I am going to look at it. <laughs> um, but I think I think a lot of of that came from potentially James's effect as well. So um, yeah, I mean that for me, um, it's just one that I've performed again and again and then again and again. And if if someone threw me straight into the deep end somewhere and all I had was a pack of cards, I just know I can go in that routine and it's a good few minutes of entertainment for people. It's a great one for audience as well because it's a genuine exploration of the way our brains work and our attention work. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like a, well, it's not really a pseudo explanation for something because you're actually showing how people can be distracted in that moment and these things can happen in front of them. But what I really yes. love about the structure of that routine is um, not only does it build but it builds because the audience know it's going to happen, but it still yeah. happens regardless of them being aware of it. You see, I mean, obviously, you know, performing with people yourself, you'll know you get different types of people that, uh, ex how do I say this, experience magic in different kind of ways. Some people like to look at it and, uh, and kind, of, kind of try and figure out what's going on. And then you've got other people who are just going to scream. Other people are sat there silence, just dumbfounded. Um, but I think it's one of those uh, routines that, for those people who sat there trying to figure this out, they get to a point and go, oh, I've no idea what's going on. It's just, it's just the, because again, like you say, they know it's going to happen and it still happens, you know? Yep. Great choice. Uh, it's one that I recommend cool. people check out as well. It's really, really good. Uh, but what's in your third position, Adam? So I'm going to shake things up and change the order to which I've got written down because I'm not throwing another card trick in there, Jamie. Um, so, my next item, um, and I'm going to put a broad uh, theme around this item for now, but then I will zoom in, I'm, I'll promise. So um, any kind of 50-50 choice routine, I'm obsessed with this idea of a one in two. 
Um, I just, I mean, there are there are tons of different examples out there of um, these types of effects. I think, you know, you've got like a mine and yours type presentation that I've seen. I think somebody's spoken about that on 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 the podcast already. Um, I know that. Um, uh, you know, people have done some on, some stuff on stage with just two big envelopes. Um, however, for close up, and this is where my honourable mentions are going to start coming in. Um, I have a uh, a routine with two folded business cards, where um, I place one on the participant's hand and one on my hand, and I say, um, at the end of the, there's an outcome in mind that I'm trying to get to. Um, at the end of this, the, the business card that's in your hand, that will be yours to open and that will be yours to keep. Um, you only have, uh, you know, you only have one decision to make really, which is do you want to switch or do you want to stay where we are? And that's kind of the, the kind of setup for that. And it's just a nice little checking exercise with a group or with one person. Um, and again, it's a, it's a 50-50, right? And, and there are a number of things that I have uh, toyed around with being written on those cards. Um, and of course, that kind of changes the theme of it. Uh, but I must mention Rich Relish, because Rich Relish, uh, for those who haven't seen Rich, go and check out his work. He And I don't even think this is released, so I can't say what it is. But Rich has got a brilliant idea using that 50-50, and it's a bit kind of tongue-in-cheek, quite playful. Um, and what I can say, though, is that that routine utilizes Lewis Laval's OTT move, for those who have seen it. Uh, so it's a 50-50 use, using that. However, I've not opted for that. What I've opted for is Lucky Envelopes by Luca Volpe. Um, so in my part, my kind of parlor set, or if I'm doing a private party where there's kind of 30 to 40 people, um, time and time again, Lucky Envelopes has found its way into my set list. Um, and over time, I have changed it. So I have I have a variation now where I have a third envelope, um, and somebody else must have done this. So you know I'm not there with it, but third envelope, and uh, I introduced the idea of the Monty Hall problem. Now I know Darren's done some stuff on stage, kind of where's Darren's shoe, using the Monty Hall problem as well. Um, but I introduce um. So, you know, for those who haven't seen Lucky Envelopes, you've got two envelopes with a one and a two on, and it's a green and a red envelope. And there's a load of fun you can have with your audience. But essentially, they are going to choose one of the envelopes. They get the contents of that envelope, and you open the other envelope to show what they could have won, essentially. And you can imagine what that what that plays out like. Um, but I introduce a third envelope, which is a mysterious envelope with no number on, which is a black, sleek, sexy envelope. And it's just that kind of temptation to bring them over to this third envelope, which gets introduced after the first two. Uh, so I've had a lot of fun uh, with variations of it, but even in its kind of, um, I, don't, I don't want to call it basic form because it's a brilliant effect, but it, it, for lack of better words, in its basic form, um, I still think it plays really well. It's a great way to check in with your audience, or you can have it as a, an effect that runs throughout your show, right? It's a it's a thread that can run throughout. It can kind of hang. It can be a bit of a skeleton that you keep coming back to, playing with your audience member. Again, I've seen um, it, Darren had that with on one of his stage shows where he had the five thousand, the five hundred, didn't he? Where he kind of kept coming back and say, "You sure you don't want to switch?" Um, so you can have a lot of fun. So that is in my third position, lucky envelopes. Very, very good choice. I agree. I think a lot of magicians might overlook a 50-50, but certainly earlier on in your routine, uh, but case in point, Andy Nyman's chair swindle, which is a 50-50 choice with yeah. two chairs uh, where an audience member comes down. It just takes what could be a really dull moment in your show, just someone coming down it's great. and turns it, it into great. a piece of theatre. Um, I know Colin McLeod has a, a really great one with feather uh, feathers in a brick, I think it was, or feathers in a glass, um, where he has okay. two gifts and he invites them onto stage. Um, and then when he <laughs> he puts his hand on the table, I think, and when he drops it, a brick comes out. Um, yes, or a I have or seen this. Come out. Um, which is yes. uh, great. And the idea of that, that danger element being put into it really does give validity to a 50-50 plot because... You know, that could have gone really wrong. And actually, 50-50 makes it a lot scarier. Whereas if you had one yeah. in five, that outcome probably isn't as impressive. So, yeah, I do think that there are certain 50-50 plots that 
are really clever in how they deal with making a 50-50 choice more substantial for an audience and more interesting. Yeah, and I also think with just just in terms of that kind of, some people may look at a 50-50 and go, oh, well, it's only one in two. But And again, back to that kind of close-up version that I mentioned earlier on, um, I kind of want people going away from that thinking, would, it, would he have been so confident like how would he, like he's not going to be that confident if he's you know what I mean it's only a one in two so um, yeah I think there are kind of presentational things you can do to kind of uh, make that stronger but I mean I, I spoke to Steve Cook recently and Steve Cook was like do not underplay a one in two it is so powerful um, but I mean we could get very distracted but yeah that is my uh, third position there you go. Well, that brings us on to your halfway point. What's in at number four? Number four. Question is, do I put... Wait a minute. One, two, three. I'm just making sure. I thought I had nine then for it. Well, I did. It's fine. It's fine. I'm going to have to be strict. Um, So the next item is another card trick. Um, However, I think after this, there's only one more card trick. So... um, this card trick is pro- out of what's here is probably something that is a little bit more recent, and this is out. Uh, this is a an effect called probably impossible, and it's out of a Ben Earl book called Inside Out, which I think is only probably what maybe three years old. Um, so for those who, and again, I'll, I'll very quickly mention what it is. So for, the, for those who aren't uh, familiar, essentially. Um, you show the deck, you show all the cards that are different. Uh, one of the cards is remembered in one area of the deck and another card is remembered from another area of the deck. So there's two different positions in the deck. You close everything up, you give the deck to the participant who cuts the deck a few times. Uh, you talk about... Um, it's a really interesting hook around uh, probability. So just something being, being highly improbable versus being impossible. And that, that's kind of why I like this effect. It's just really playful with this idea that a lot of the time people use the word impossible to describe what I do, but, but actually that's maybe inaccurate. A lot of what I do is just highly improbable. And it just it's an interesting talking point and something for them to focus on. So um, essentially what happens is, re, you know, regardless of this very hands-off effect, they're cutting the deck a few times, and when they spread through, the two cards that were remembered are now next to each other in the deck, um, which, you know, in itself as a phase one is, is fairly impressive and it does kind of knock people because they, they don't think that's going to happen. But I say to them, look, you were, I say mixing the cards, you were mixing the cards and still you were cutting the cards, you were mixing the cards and, and those cards, you know, they could come together in theory. Um So then you move on to the second phase in which you say, in fact, somebody else is just going to remember a card. Um, So they do. And then uh, the two cards from the first phase are then slid into the deck together face up. Um, You know, they're clearly together in the face uh, in the deck. They're face up. So obviously it's contrasting from the remainder of the deck. Uh, The deck is closed up. You pass them to a participant. uh, They take them in the hands and you say, now in theory, if we were to continue mixing and cutting the cards, then the cards could move around again. And uh, the card that you're merely thinking of could uh, land near those two cards. Um, and in, you know, in, in some extreme cases, it could land in between the two cards. Um, but again, I wanted to show you the difference between impossible and highly improbable. And then, uh, of course, we do nothing. And whenever they're ready, they spread the deck. And the card they're thinking of, well, one card has materialized between the two face-up cards. They take it out, and it is, of course, the card that they were thinking of. So, um, it's honestly, it's a brilliant effect. I really enjoy performing this, and this is, this is 100% in my working set now. I, I perform this all the time with people. Um, and, yeah, I just it was one of them that nearly didn't make the list because it's not really um, stood the test of time in my working set yet. Um but I can tell that it will. Like it's just such a strong effect, and I think the most uh, standout feature of this for me is that it all feels very hands off. Everything happens in their hands, which you know, for, I mean, as a rule of thumb, automatically makes it a better experience for them. So that is my number four. There we go. Great choice. Yeah, I think that multi-phase uh, thing where you almost tell them where it's going 
but they they can't work out how that's going to be achieved in the circumstances that that you've given them the fact that the cards are in their hands that you know they're in control of everything they're cutting the cards and yet it still mm-hmm. happens it does sort of remind me of the card under box it's that same you know you know what's going to happen but it's still <laughs> going to happen and you're not going to know how how it how it was achieved i just think for me it's the um all right i mean obviously i said the, probably the major thing there is that it's hands off but also probably in a close second is just this interesting hook that it has about it um you know impossible versus improbable i'm kind of just playing around with that kind of line a bit so yeah that is uh number four and i if you want i can move on to number five well that yeah that takes us over your halfway point so what's in your it fifth does, position does. so my next item is sneak thief by well i said so obviously larry becker in its origins but I think the version that I perform is probably closer to Andy Nyman's Magician's Graphology. Um, but I have also in Parlor played around with um, Mark Spellman's oh, Thief in the... I want to say Night Dark, one of them. Thief in the Dark, maybe. Um, so I've, I've played around with, with that as well. But um, my kind of go-to is just, you know a number of business cards, a number of people were at an event or something, um, and I'll often get them to draw something or think of something that they could associate. Um, I'll kind of theme it towards whatever event I'm at, right, um, and go into it. There's, there's not too much more to say around that. Like, for people who haven't seen Sneak Thief or uh, Magician's Graphology or something like that, um, essentially you have a number of people uh, draw something or write something down, um, and uh, they're collected in and mixed up into an order that, so that nobody knows whose is whose. Um, and uh, progressively, you reveal which item belongs to which person. Um, uh, and essentially, well, in a number of handlings, the, the final item will never be seen, but then you are able to do some kind of drawing duplication uh, for the final um, business card that you've not seen. Now, uh, that that tends to be how I end it. I end up doing a little bit of a drawing duplication, or I just do a verbal reveal. I imagine get them to imagine drawing it again, and then I do a verbal reveal. And um, what I also uh, my not not justification, but a motivation that I have later on is I say, um, so for example, if I'm at a wedding, I will often say, um, now usually if you're at a, a wedding as a guest, you will either know the the bride or the groom or the groom and the groom, whoever it is, right? Uh, one of one of the couple better, right? It might be um, it might be Tom, it might be Sarah. We don't know, but or maybe it's both of them. But either way, I want you to think of a memory with that person that you could summarize in an image that if you were to show everybody, people would understand what the image is. So I just try and attach it some way to the event that we're at. So I do that. And then what I say is um, afterwards, I say, oh, would you mind if I kept these? Because I'd love to give them to the couple as a as a souvenir. Um, so And I do that. And I just say, look, we've had some fun today. We were drawing some images. We were kind of doing some mind reading. But this is what your friends and family have drawn. Uh, you know, you might not understand the context, but it might be fun to look at. And I just give them to the, the groom, uh, the bride and groom, or the groom, groom, bride and bride at the end of the event, just so they've got something extra to kind of look through. And it's kind of fun, especially when the guests have had a few wines because they draw terrible things, Jamie. Uh, but yeah, I mean, for me, it's quite a versatile um, effect in that you could you can kind of put your own presentational layer on top of what is a fairly sound method essentially um so yeah that is uh i don't know what spot we're on that is my next item <laughs> it's one of those <laughs> ones that uh it, it's it's popping up in a few of these sneak thief um okay typically the same versions um and mm. i mean there are sort of modern versions i know darren brown did a a version of sneak thief where he actually extended the method even more in his most recent stage show last yes. last year or the year before uh, which was his opening gambit so it was the opening routine yeah. which i don't actually think made the tv version so if you've seen the tv version i'm afraid you wouldn't have seen this routine but it uses um used couples 
who came yeah. up onto the stage. Yeah. Um, but he managed to get more out of that method than in previous versions, which was super, super clever. Uh, and I know that Andy Nyman in his recent lecture notes has a wonderful version with phones in a bag, yeah. which is just <laughs> excellent. So, yeah, there are some really, really good versions of Sneak Thief. It's a, a really sound method. It's great. It's one of those tricks that if you have it in your knowledge bank as opposed to like a physical prop bank, it's not something that you have to have sure. in a close-up case. You're right in that you need a couple of business cards and you've got a killer piece of mentalism without the need of envelopes or a certain kind of wallet or ju there's just <laughs> nothing that's needed. It's just a, a couple of cards. Um, and you can do it with more. You can ha you can upscale it to five people if you really want to yeah, do five sure. people or... You know, it, it's just perfect. It, it's really, really, really cool. Um, a great choice. Hello, guys. I'm here to talk to you about Alakazam Unlimited. This is the best streaming platform in the world, I'm telling you now. With Alakazam Unlimited, you get access to over 150 magic routines. This is video performances and explanations. We have card magic, coin magic, kids magic, rope magic, mentalism, stage, parlor, impromptu. We've got you covered. All of this for the low price of just £4.99 a month and you can cancel at any time. Perfect if you've got commitment issues. Yes, I'm talking to you. Guys, you are going to absolutely love it. If you haven't joined the platform already, what the heck are you doing? Alakazam Unlimited is a streaming platform that you need to be a part of. Not only that, there is also exclusive content only available on the platform. Check it out now, alakazam.co.uk. Cheers. And that brings us on to your sixth position. So what do you have in your sixth place? Oh, I feel like I need another card trick, Jamie. So, uh, <laughs> but this is with a twist. This is with a twist, right? So, um, and there's there's been two effects in my mind since since you asked me about coming on um, that have been kind of neck and neck a little bit around who was going to take this spot. Um so no hard feelings to the one that didn't take the spot. I will mention it, of course. Um, but what I've always found plays well is a blank deck finish. And um, I mean, it can be it can be overdone. Um, I think we, we've seen that. But I think for me, there was there's two routines or effects, I should say, that I have performed with blank deck finishes that have always landed particularly well. Now, um, uh, for I mean, many people uh, probably won't know, but uh, I've, I've spent a, a number of, uh, well, probably three years now, probably coming up, um, performing at the Oracle Bar in Liverpool. Now, I've not, uh, I must admit, I don't perform there as, as frequently as I did do. I've just got lots of other stuff going on, and I've also got a full-time job alongside all of this, so uh, that's fun to try and balance. Um, but 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 these two routines have, have both been kind of go-tos in that kind of uh, environment where you kind of sat down at a table with guests. It's very relaxed. You know, it's kind of a speakeasy vibe. Um, but it, for me, sat down at a table... Uh, these two effects have been kind of perfect for that. So I'll go into the one that I chose, and then I'll mention the other one. So, so the one that I've chosen is actually, uh, I believe, it's Liam Montier's big kick, which is um, playing on the idea of Gemini twins, um, but it's you're getting more out of it because you've got an additional pairing as well going on, and it allows me to get multiple people involved. You know, I'm saying to, I, I choose some cards for people and I say, in fact, you get to choose where they go. As we go through the deck, they say where they want, they exactly where they want those cards to go and they go back into the deck and all three participants are doing this. And uh, obviously we spread the deck later to find out how they did. Uh, not only have they found one pair, they've found two pairs and they found all three pairs. And I've just got this thing around, um usually if we can get one in three, that's considered lucky. And then I kind of go into it. But that kind of blank deck finish at the end when you turn it over and I kind of dribble all the cards on the table and they kind of go everywhere and they're all blank, it just knocks people. Because what what they've just achieved 
as a collective is mind-blowing anyway. From a deck of cards, they were able to find the partner of the card that they had without looking, essentially, in what they they see they would consider to be a shuffled deck. Um, but then when you kind of, you know, and don't rush that kind of blank deck finish, right? Um, make sure everything stays in view, or people think there's a deck switch potentially. But, you know, the deck's on the table still. So, you know, they turn those over, and it's these kind of big moments where they found the matching cards, letting that play out, and then at the end kind of saying, you know what, it's even more impressive considering there were no other cards, and you can just dribble them and let them all kind of spread on the table. And it's just everyone immediately grabs the cards. Like, it's just this moment so for me that kind of goes in there uh, the the other effect that i mentioned uh was an effect called instacan by joel dickinson um and it, don't get me wrong it's it's not the same in fact it's a very different effect in that it's not a matching effect it's not where they're trying to find the partner card um but it essentially i mean as the name suggests it's an a can but what you do have at the end is this same feeling, which is that, I mean, that's even more impressive that you've, that's the number you chose given that there are no other cards. And again, you get this moment where you can kind of dribble the cards down onto the table. Everything's blank. And again, everyone tries to grab the cards. So those are the two that were head in head, but I'll, uh, I'll give it to Liam. <laughs> yeah. Well, c- Liam's also got another trick called casino kick, um, yes, yeah, but, which is yeah. similar in, in, that it uses that that same structure of trick, but um, at the end, all of the cards are one the same one. one card, which still works incredibly well. Um, but one, what the first blank trick I remember ever seeing was Dean Deal's Blizzard, and I remember mm. that feeling. It was in Davenport's when I was like sixteen, and that feeling of that seeing the whole deck was blank, and that was the only choice was absolutely mind-blowing but what's yeah, really interesting it, about a blank deck ending is there's two ways that it could go right so it's either did the deck was the deck there but it turned yeah. blank or mm-hmm. were the cards always blank so that was your only option and decision yeah and i think that's i think on that point i mean that kind of summarizes my entire approach to magic my mine would always be the second one so my, my, I, I want the participant to go away from that feeling like they, they achieve, they achieve the impossible, which I'm not, I'm not claiming the deck has turned blank. I am showing them that that was even more impressive than you just thought it was because there were no other cards. So, yeah. Yeah. It's a really, really good trick. And again, Adam's right. If you don't do a blank deck ending or a same card ending, then you're really, really missing out because they are phenomenal effects. Um, but that takes us into the tail end of your eight tricks. So we're on number seven. Okay. What's in your seventh position, Adam? Seventh position is the witch hand effect. Uh, so, again, I would say by now that's a very broad um, bucket, let's say, for effects. There are a lot of different approaches to witch hand. Um, and I, what I will say is for a long period of time, I used Flux. So I used, um, I think you can say this, an electronic solution. Can I say that? If not, you're going to have to edit this out. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah okay. So I, uh, for the longest time, I used an electronic solution to the witch hand uh, present uh, uh, routine. And uh, it was fine. It was great. It was fun. Um, and... Um, I, in the background, I've, I've, I've played around with other routines and I, I became a little bit obsessed with it at one point when I was kind of digging into uh, lots of effects. And, and I was trying to develop my own version that I could just do on the fly if someone said to me, can, can you show me something? Um, and I always loved the idea of saying, yeah, let's play a game. And I'm dressing it up as a bit of a game. So you know that game you used to play as a kid, you hold like hide something in one of your hands, someone has to guess where it is. Just leading into it around this idea of a game. So I actually um have my own 
which hand routine now, uh, which uh, you, you don't know this, but it's based on, uh, well, it's based on two things. One, one thing of yours it's based on, um, which I'll tell you about in a sec. Uh, I'm sure you'll know it. Uh, and then the other <laughs> thing it's based on is Scott, uh, something in Scott Creasy's work. So by, by letting you know what of Scott Creasy's it's based on, you'll probably kind of put two and two together. But Scott Creasy has got this wonderful idea called structured imagery. And it's based on the idea by knowing one piece of information, we can build these other thoughts or images in somebody's head by leading them down a bit of a track, right? Um, and the thing for you is based on is uh, your uh, book, The Tracker, which is a wonderful book. So if you've not seen that by Jamie, go and check it out. Um, but it's this idea roughly that we know some information, right? And, and as a result, uh, therefore, we can uh, – we can take advantage of that. So just kind of bringing it back to the witch hand routine for me, I don't really want to go too much into the, the full in outs of it, uh, but essentially uh, I'm using a thought of number. So people are thinking of a number. In fact, I usually get quite a few people in a, a group to think of a number. And then I say, okay, I, th- I think this will work well with you. And I single somebody out um, and uh, they essentially have a, a secret number in mind uh, and they have a folded up business card in their hand and they go behind their back because they've written their number down. And essentially uh, I say, uh, now you're going to hide it in one of two hands, but here's the thing I'm going to assign uh, one of your hands kind of uh, and a uh, kind of feature. So if it's less than a hundred, uh, less than 50, it's going to go here more than 50. You'll put it here. If I can read your body language correctly, then I learn a bit of information about your number. So I essentially do this to kind of, uh, owning on the number and i have a few other kind of rounds within there um but yeah that's uh that wouldn't be in existence really without uh, your work on the tracker um and scott creasy's work he's, although he's building images off of something i'm kind of again similar to the tracker that i'm kind of giving them instructions to do something based on um some information that i in theory don't know right so um it's kind of a witch hand on its head mm-hmm. <laughs> a little bit. Um, and I know that you've got some work on the witch hand within the tracker as well, using things. So, um, but yeah, that is, uh, in arts number, I want to say seven. That is, I'm sure you've got yeah, some yep. stuff to touch. On, so, yeah. Well, that's, it, it's one of those things that there are lots of witch hand solutions. I know Timo and Kraus has got a, a, an excellent book uh, with, uh, with his th- thoughts on it, which are, is a very clean version. Earlier on, you mentioned Joel Dickinson, who went about it in a different approach with his version with um, business cards, essentially, which is a really yeah. clever way around it. And very. then, yeah, my so my approach was just to use information, you know, which is there is other work with like train tracking and stuff like that where you have information yeah. that you, you allow people to grow on and you know all the way back to grey elephants in Denmark really what's so, the um, what's the object that you use do you use a coin or do you use business cards so I use the business card they write their number on nice perfect um, yeah so I say look you're gonna uh, well there's a yeah there's a few things going on there and I mean I'll probably t- I'll teach it somewhere at some point uh, but it's um, yeah, it's something that I, I do perform again and again. And if I was, um, I also, and I'm sure people listening this, listening to this, um, if, if I'm working with a two digit number, you don't have to think too far based on other things that exist in the magic world, which allows you to build more of a routine with this, let's just say. So I don't end by that. There's another kind of kicker at the end not with that number actually, but with somebody else's number who gave an example at the start. So you have this moment where you say part of what I do is about pulling information from people just like we've done with you. But another part of what I do is pushing information to people without them really knowing. And then I've got this other ending where something else happens, but you have to utilize other things. I'm speaking very cryptically, but I'm sure people will be able to get onto that. Yeah, no, that (laughs) sounds great. It sounds like you've really squeezed the most that you can out of that as well. Um, as a concept, which, you know, is excellent. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll just give a shout out actually, because it was only when I shared this routine um, with a, a guy called Luke Morgan, who works at the Oracle, who was the one saying, Oh, by the way, Adam, I've been doing your routine and I've been doing this at the end. And I was like, why have I not been doing that? So <laughs> um, yeah, that shout out to Luke. <laughs> Amazing. So that 
brings us to your last item. Uh, now, you said that you had nine, so is there going to be an honourable mention or are you just going to well, completely funnily scrap enough, one? No, funnily enough, I actually had nearly had Volition on there by Joel Dickinson. Ah, and I know you've nice. just briefly mentioned yeah, a bit yeah. earlier on. Um, there, there are probably a couple of other bits in there, like um, before I mention this last one, so like Bold Business by Patrick Cuffs for a long time was my kind of go-to drawing duplication or something um but again i was combining bold business with other things to make it into a more of a routine uh, but that was up there but yeah volition was uh, like i've performed that for quite a while again and like you said he, he took that kind of idea and, and kind of spun it on its head so if anyone's not kind of checked that out uh, you should um but yeah on to my final one then so for my final one and this will be no surprise to you jamie um, basically is anything using the diabolical principle by Steve Cook. Um, so uh, I'm not sure how openly I, I can talk about it. I, I'm, there's there's a lot of examples out there of people who have, have kind of took, took inspiration from Steve's thinking around uh, this principle. Um, I, probably, I can probably name a few of the effects. So I, I first saw this with uh, Psycho Dice, which um, which was one of the earliest versions. I know that uh, Kmart Magic also had Gamble, which was a a four item version. Let's just say that using uh, the, like expanding the diabolical principle. Uh, but I know in more recent times, Andy Nyman's Skulls on a Spike um has kind of uh, borrowed well you know, I mean, he's utilized the principle essentially uh, and i know i think alakazam have also got is it is it just diabolical that is with the six yeah no i think it's uh, yeah, it diabolical it wrong? v5 or something like that yeah yeah diabolical v5, v5, yeah so many versions but it's it's because it's such a great principle though it's fantastic and it's it's well laid it's well thought um i think for me i'd and again, you you already mentioned at the start, but um, my effect Loki is um, you know heavily heavily um, in existence because of Steve's work, right? It just wouldn't be a thing without Steve's work. And I I played around with the diabolical principle for a long time with like um, the, using the diabolical principle, but in in invisible ways. And then I had versions with like poker chips, but I knew gamble had already been done. Um, I played around with Lego bricks and I knew apparently that's already been done. And then I was playing around with like multiple locks and multiple keys. Um, and then obviously um, what we have today is, is kind of a more minimal offering low key, but it's, um, it's definitely something that I go out and perform. And, and what's been really nice is people reaching out to me saying like, I'm performing it like all, all the time now in their effect, in their, um, in their gigs and things at their events or just with friends and family. So, um, yeah, it's lovely having people kind of reach out and say, Oh, I've done this, Adam, have you tried this and sharing ideas back to me now, which is lovely. Um, so yeah, that's in my last spot, but I would probably just, you know, I'd like to expand that to kind of the diabolical principle if I could, if that's all right, Jamie, I know that's kind of bending the rules a little bit, but there you go. <laughs> no, I, th I think you've mentioned enough there. I mean, for me personally, Oops. I've, you know, there's lots of, like you just said, there are lots of versions of this. And I know that you would never say this, but I do think that your version is the best version that I've seen using the method. Thank you, man. That means a lot. I think th there was, I mean, that was what I was battling with for a long time was kind of, I suppose, the construction of the effect and how to ensure that the participant has that same feeling pretty much every time, regardless of what happens um yeah it's really hard to talk about this without without giving things away isn't it yeah yeah it's um, really difficult but yeah no thank you um yeah that means a lot though thank you so it's a great list yeah, nice fun. nice and diverse and there's a couple of things there that people can go and check out as well certainly i'll be checking out the scott creasy um effect myself um but that does bring us on to the two curveball items because you're only allowed one oh, each no, of no. them um so what did you go for your book Oh, mate, this this was the one where I had the most honourable mention, <laughs> mentions. Because there were so many. So I do need to mention a couple of books here before I mention the one that I would take with me. Um, so two books I want to mention. One is Dear Mr. Fantasy by John Bannon. Because that was very... It was just... I was at an age where it was just very... For me, that felt like the step up from... 
maybe like beginner and intermediate. It was when I was starting to take card magic a bit more seriously, study card magic more. Um, and there's some brilliant effects in there. And I remember um, there's an effect called Dead Reckoning. I just know I had no idea how it worked until I, I'd seen like a video of it, and I was just like, "How is that even possible?" And it was one of those moments again where I just got so giddy and excited when I fa- when I finally got the book open and read it. Um, but there's some amazing effects in there still from from John Bannon. So, dear Mister Fantasy was was. I mean, I read it in about. I remember my parents got it me one Christmas, and I read it in about two days he's just sat with a deck of cards and just went through it cover to cover and then went back through again things like um you know the origami poker and things like that are in there and there's some amazing things in there so believe it or not that's an honorable mention um and then uh, the other book that i want to mention is uh, and this is because it starts to think gets you to think more on um how you think about your magic um well, and, and other areas, I would say, uh, which is One Degree by John Gustafaro. Now, and I was actually surprised when I got to the end of my list that I've not included any John Bannon on John, any John Gustafaro in my list um, because I love both of their work. Um, but again, the, you know, the second book there, One One Degree, really makes you think about how do you make those marginal gains, how do you make those uh, micro changes to what you're doing it's to make marginal gains so that over time you can kind of get these, uh, you know, big, big results without the trauma of like big bang change. Um, so if anyone's not checked out either of those books, please do so. Um, but the book I'm going to have to choose, and it's not typically a magic book, Jamie, so I am breaking your rules. I am sorry. Um, but it's magic related. Um, a Little Happier by Darren Brown. And it is the Notes for Reassurance. And the reason... Um, for this is um, it, so you mentioned Darren's last stage show earlier on and um, and I mentioned the Oracle Bar er- earlier on so just before Darren's show came to Liverpool uh, I want to say it was in June t- June 22 maybe something like that um, uh, Andy Frost at the time was working on Darren's team And he put something out on Instagram. I think I I chatted to him a little bit anyway. And he said, oh, hey, we're in Liverpool. If any magicians are out, let us know. So um, me and Andy got chatting. um, And he said, oh, like, um, I think think Brad, um, what's his face? Brad, oh, I'm going to get his name wrong now. Brad. Oh, geez. I'm gonna. I'm butchering his name. Brad is a superb cardition, though. So if you ever ever get a chance to see him, he won't perform for you for the longest time. But when he does, he'll your head will fall off. Um, anyway, Brad was working on the team as well. And um, uh, Andy uh, said, oh, like we'd, we'd looked at the Oracle and like we we'd, we were going to bob in. Like, so we basically met them one night, Andy and Brad and, and Tom was a guy working on the show as well um, with a couple of uh, the magicians from the Oracle. We just met up and like hung out for a bit. And then Andy dropped the bombshell on Ben and was like, Darren wants to come in to the Oracle. And we were like, okay, that's cool. Like after he's like playing it cool, <laughs> um, after his show one night, um, and so essentially, without going all to you know all through the logistics of it, um, one night after they performed the show, um, kind of later on in the evening, probably half eleven onwards, uh, Andy, Brad, Tom, uh, Darren, and his partner came into the Oracle um, in the, and we had like a private room at the back. And um, Ben, who uh, owns the Oracle, asked uh, me, Lewis Laval, and Terry to, to perform. So, so we had to do private performances uh, at the table for, for Darren's table. But, I mean, sorry, that sounds so weird. They didn't demand us to do private performances. It's just, you know, that's what we were doing. And um, it was honestly one of the most weird but fulfilling and fun experiences i've ever had in magic and and it, and it's it's so weird thinking how much i'll be honest, probably to say how much darren and darren's team and andy and people like the writers and things like that around darren how much they've impacted how a lot of people in the oracle bar and all the performers in there now think and, and probably why half of them do magic um so you know we just kind of 
uh, kind of Darren Kane. They were lovely. It was the best audience because they were like, we never get to see magic like this. This is amazing. Um, you know, because they're always busy doing doing all their other stuff. But um, at the end, you know, Darren was very kind and he offered to kind of do pictures and, and sign things. And, and the book, I had it in my bag and he was like, yeah, let me sign it. And he signed So I've got a personalized signed book from Darren, which, you know, it's just, it's very special. And uh, that that's why that's there. But it's, um, if not, you can take uh, one degree or dear Mr. Fantasy. So there you go. <laughs> no, I, th- I think it's a great, great choice. I've actually read um, Happier and A Little Bit Happier as well. Um, and both of them are great. So the, for those that don't know, it's basically Darren's sort of self-help book, I guess, is the best yeah. way to do it, yeah. to, to say. And what's really interesting is um, the book goes about it from, from a stoic philosophy, which is what sort it of Der- Darren... Yeah follows but several years ago there was a release of Darren's deck through theory 11 and with that there there were a limited edition amount that were set out and it was basically a virtual treasure hunt is the only way that I could 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 say and part of that was like it took you to a virtual bookshop that they'd set up it was very very elaborate um and oh, wow. And that was like a Stoic bookshop. So all of the Uh, titles were from from Stoics and stuff like that. So then reading his book, there are like little influences dotted about here, there and everywhere. So I'm not sure if anyone ever found the answer to it. I certainly didn't. I didn't have a clue what was going on for for most of it. Um, But it was very interesting. Maybe there never was an answer, Jamie. Maybe there never was. And maybe that was the answer. The answer was that there was no answer. It's all getting yeah. very. But yeah, I mean, I mean, kind of story story aside, and obviously there's like um, a personal meaning to that book to me. But like even the, just the contents of the book and and some of the lessons that are in there, I've I've definitely um, learned. From, I mean, not. I mean, I'm kind of I've kind of been exposed to some of that way of thinking previously. But but Darren, there was a lot of stuff in there that kind of um, solidified my approaches, if you will, to, to just to life in general. Um, so yeah, like that is uh, the book, and now moving on to the final item. This is such a cop out, but like generally, so I don't know what I'm, al- I'm allowed, but um, I would say um, a picture of my family because, um, and I don't know if I would I use it in magic. To be f- to be fair, my my wife would probably be happy if she never saw a magic trick again. Uh, however, um, uh, my wife and my little boy. Um, you know, they, they mean everything to me. So I would say if I wasn't allowed to have them with me, um, probably a picture of them, that's allowed. Um, my little boy's funny now because he, he has this uh, concept of magic work or computer work. That's what daddy does. He does one of those two things. So I say, oh, go, go to work. He goes, which one are you doing, magic work or computer work? Um, yeah, I mean, I think he just keeps picking decks of cards up and throwing them around. So that's his version of magic. Um Maybe he could learn a thing or two. But yeah, I mean, that's for me, that'd be it. That'd be it. Family uh, through and through. Because I mean, as much as much fun as all of this is, um, it probably wouldn't be worth doing otherwise. So uh, there you go. Nice. I will let you have that. You can take that away with you. Um, I would say you could have probably bent the rules and just taken those with you as the actual people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but instead, you're uh, going to take a picture, so it's fine. <laughs> uh, but yeah that's a great great choice really um, nice to see your sort of progression through all of these different things as well and how you've got such a nice mix of sort of traditional mentalism like you know sneak thief all the way to slightly more modern effects as well um and then of course yeah your your book choice with with a lovely little story there of you meeting mr brown himself mm. Yes. So what does the yeah. future hold for Adam Dadswell? Where can we find out more about you should we want to? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, people can, I mean, I'm on Facebook, so people can add me on there. Um, I, I tend to only have it for magic. That's the only really reason I've got Facebook. Um, I am on Instagram, but I mean, that I tend to put a few shots up of gigs and things like that. I get quite a few inquiries through Instagram. Uh, but I've just set up, Took, took a leap of faith and I've just set up my own uh, independent store as well. Um, so um, 
I'll, I'll do a very quick plug, if I may, which is um, it's uh, deceptive-secrets.co.uk. So um, I won't say anything else, but it's just, it's all on there. And I'm starting to put some stuff on there. But, you know, I'm hopefully, I mean, I'm in chats with a few people about potentially doing other releases and things. I've got stuff upcoming. Um, and, yeah, it's an exciting time. I'm happy to be sharing stuff with the community as long as people want me to share stuff with the community. So, um yeah, I mean, yeah, drop me a, a message on Facebook if anyone wants to chat through anything. Um, I'll, I'll check that stuff out. Amazing. Good job. And do do that. Um, do go check out Adam's stuff because there's some really smart stuff, whether you're into your mentalism or your finger flicking card slights as well. He's got it all. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Adam, for ch- sharing your list. It was a great list. Thank you. Uh, And with that being said, thank you all for listening to another episode of Desert Island Tricks. And we will hear from you again next week. Goodbye for now. Hi, Peter Nardi here, and I really hope you enjoyed that podcast. I just wanted to make you know that Alakazam have their own app. You can download it from the App Store or the Google Play Store. By downloading the app, it will make your shopping experience even slicker at Alakazam. You'll also get exclusive in-app offers and in-app live streams. So go download it now and we'll see you on the next podcast.